Hey everybody. I worked on this a little bit more while not recording. So just to cover some of the simple techniques I've been playing with. One is dealing with these fine details for this. And the trick with these, uh, I think it's something where people do it wrong all the time. You need to focus on general to specific. So I'm going to keep using the Craig Mullins oil pastel. Uh, so, for instance, if I were to do the details on this little section here, this little window, uh, the first thing I'm going to start doing is actually using shift while I paint a lot. And what shift does is if I hold shift while painting, it will paint straight lines. If I zoom way out, a lot of these problems are going to come right out and smack me in the face. So I think you can see that the side of the building is still too dull. It needs more vibrancy. <coughs> and I think this window is slightly too intense. I'm just going to add some of this blue color in. Maybe some of this tan color and see if I can just mud mix my way into something that's closer to that less intense version that I'm looking for. That's pretty good. And now, because I'm working general to specific, this little overhang shape is something that you see all the time. and <coughs> it's so much easier to paint this general shape and then add this dark line on top of it than to just fiddle constantly trying not to touch this at all. In fact, if I have to go over this, Painting a fair amount now with shift being held. And now for that interior bar. Get back to that intense red. Still getting over cold. I always end up having a cold when it's the time that I'm recording. All right, get something that's warmer. Sometimes I do this sort of mud mixing style of painting where I don't know what the final result is, but I know that it needs to be a little bit more warm or saturated, so I'll put something that's really saturated in there. And then slowly paint over it a little bit by bit until it starts to feel right.
I'm not worried about the fine details of this camel's face. I'm trying to model the big shadow ideas here. And again, I'm not worried about some sort of individual separation of the camel versus the background. How would you paint this if you didn't have Photoshop and you didn't have layers? A snarky student would say, well, I would use a frisket mask, and then I would paint with reckless abandon and then pull the mask off. To that imaginary student, I say, good job. This sense of uh, just dropping plumb lines and trying to make sure it's the same on the left as it is on the right. Ooh, my foot is way off. Look at that. Um, I think it was very tied to uh, the Academy and guys like jean Leon Jerome, Charles Barg, and that certain 19th century artistic outlook. This foot's okay, I think. Uh, but it contrasts with sort of drawing bubble people and thinking through the geometry, which is something you see a lot more in comics, in anime, uh, and to go back even further, in the Renaissance, guys like Michelangelo. A lot of the appeal of like Michelangelo's drawings is that you get all persnickety about having a model handy. He was able to figure out the geometry as he was going. So this is the opposite of that. This is, can you accurately duplicate a picture plane from the left to the right? I'm trying to have brush strokes that will allow some of this texture to stay around. I think I need a darker, richer purple. Ooh.
I think one of the reasons I I'm not anti mask, anti layer, anti thermo transfer, anti filters. It's just that I have personally experienced so often the feeling of working very hard on a painting in a digital setting and then I meticulously set up this camel's layer mask and then what happens is that it's wrong <clears throat> and so imagine I'm painting this camel and I did that same sort of plumb line to see where the foot is and I discover that it's off and I can't just repaint over it. I have to repaint the mask before I can touch anything. And suddenly you feel like, you know, you've set up all this pipeline <clears throat> in your Photoshop document to meticulously be careful and non-destructive. And then it turns out you made a mistake. And it's not even a mistake. It's just part of the iterative process of figuring out what's next in a painting. And your setup with too many layers and masks makes it so that you have to destroy all your previous work of setting up layer mode transfers and stuff like that. And I just hate that feeling. And a lot of times at that point I'll just give up on a piece of art because it's too scary to fix it all. Whereas when I do this sort of one layer, one brush approach, there is no guilt, no sadness if I have to paint over everything. All right, one quick bit of masking. I guess it won't hurt. I'm gonna quickly switch to the quick mask. And with my brush turned on, I'm gonna, so I think I can write, set my color to greenish blue, bright green. I'm doing that because this is such a warm palette. Again, the way you can do that is double click on this and that's the new quick mask color. Uh, so when I hit Q, that toggles between quick mask and no mask. The quick mask is just a very temporary mask where you can draw in what you think you need. And so really quick, with a hard brush, I'm going to go in and quickly add where I think some of those yellows are going to be. The real beauty of using masks when you do use them, if you choose to use them, is that uh, you can just hit X to switch between foreground and back background color. And it's essentially that black is painting the mask on and white is taking the mask away. <laughs> So now when I hit Q and go away, you'll notice that that's now a selection. I can hide the selection with Control H, and then select some of that. Pardon me while I fix my mistake. I had to invert this selection. 
control shift I to invert my selection. And paint in some of those details. Jump around, jump around. I'm using the mixer brush right now. just to clean up some of those places where I didn't realize it but I had been on dissolve as a brush mode here so normally you want brush mode here and you can switch these modes with alt shift plus or minus there it is. alt shift plus or minus goes through all these and it differs between uh, the brush tool and the move tool so I want this to be on normal so I can also use, there's hotkeys for some of these so for instance control shift N or alt shift N is normal alt shift D is color dodge and I think I had accidentally hit uh, alt shift I for dissolve and that's why I was painting on dissolve for so long and so now I have to go through and clean up all these textures but again the nice thing about this brush approach is uh, I'm just constantly painting over whatever I already painted anyways. So it's not as bad a, a damage. The other thing that's kind of fun is if you have the move tool selected with V, then instead of that uh, alt shift plus and minus switches the layer mode transfer over here on the layer mode or on the layer rather than on the brush. So with the color mixer, I'm just selecting some of these areas and blending out that textural anomaly. I don't know if I like that. I think instead I'm going to just keep using these oil pastels. The normal brush. There we are. Oh, back on dissolve. Alt Shift N for normal mode. That's the trick with Photoshop. Is like it's so powerful, and the more hotkeys you know, the better it gets. And the less hotkeys you know, the more likely it is that you accidentally pressed one of them and didn't realize it and you turn something on or off that you didn't mean to a lot of these textural ideas that I'm getting in here is another reason that I prefer to work at full opacity brushes and instead use uh, the nearby colors as a sense of uh, what needs to modify it very slightly and gently <laughs> because when you are using a very soft brush or a very low opacity it's impossible to get that sort of texture in and so it's much better to control your edge quality first and smooth it afterwards then start off as opposed to starting off smooth and then taking forever to work your way up. This is a really beautiful subtle transition. It's dark over here just one step lighter over here. I 
I go to that. Camel Dark. Sort of, it's like sponge painting. I'm just doing tiny taps to get into this area. I think I will actually use the selection to try and get this guy's shape in. And then holding shift, I can add the selection here with the lasso tool. Where does this head land on a plumb line? It's slightly around the middle of this door. And I think I've gotten them a little too high up. So I'll subtract that. And I'll invert my selection with Control Shift I. Control H to hide my selection. Start getting that guy in. Deselect with Shift D. Where do his feet land? Right around the camel's knees? Oh, I gotta make him way shorter. Alternatively, his head. Mm, also, still not right. Camel's is okay, though. And the camel's knees are good. So I'm just going to lasso select him, hit L for lasso, and while holding Alt, I'll move this down, and then holding Shift, I'll make that so he lands right around the camel's ear, because he was a little too tall. Closer.
His uh, shirt collar is kind of tricky. You would think it's super, super light, but if you look at it, it's pretty close to the shadow that's right there. Maybe one step brighter. That needs to be a little further down. Oh, that's about right. I bet that's what was throwing me off. Is this building was slightly too high up. <coughs> it's a lot of just solving one little problem at a time. Let me get a little of that sky color in here. As for this, that's another case where I'll use V and hold Shift or Alt while moving it to clone it out. Just get it a little closer that way. And it's so easy to just go in now and try and get some of this warm color in here. A lot of times you get more saturation around the shadow. And you can kind of just see it a little bit where there's a very thin transition from in the light to red chromatic aberration to blue chromatic aberration until finally hitting the actual shadow color. This is probably a little too high and low. So this kind of area right here, this little window here, is one of my favorite things to paint. Because all it takes is a little bit of base color and then a slim line of white here while holding shift. And a little bit of shadow underneath that area. Not going to be too dark because it's kind of far away so there's more atmospheric perspective. But just a little bit right there. And it's a window. And I'm holding shift while I paint a lot right now.
Set my flow to 10%. The sky is a slightly more gentle transition than some of these city things. So looser brushwork with more stamping is good. I think this color is wrong. So I want something that's a richer blue. I'm trying to eyeball match right over here without color picking. Oops. Be a little darker. If you wanted to work on just the sky, this is a place where we can actually make some nice selection tricks. I guess you've heard enough of my platitudes that <coughs> you won't focus too much on it. But I'm going to select a color range of the blues. Or alternatively, let's go over here. Select the blue channel. And the levels. I'm going to make that way aggressively crazy, right? So that does a pretty good job of hiding all the building stuff. Now I can go in and with white, no, with black. I'll just paint in more selection as I see fit. Oh no, <laughs> that was the master copy. None of that mattered. Here's what I wanted. So first off, I can clean it up there. Uh, I really like the quick mask tool and using that for selections. I think it's like even just a philosophical point. We're in here to digitally paint, right? And so the number one tool I think that we should feel comfortable with is a paintbrush. So if you're going to do selections, you don't really want to care about channels or lassos or pointing and clicking your way in. You'd want to be more artistic, right, and brush your way in. I think this is probably the next thing I'm going to work on is getting this in. Anyways, if you did something like this, you can pretty quickly get an approximation of what's sky and what's not. I'm going to hit I just um, I'm used it. How much that dissolve accident earlier on is still haunting me. Doesn't matter. So now, if I wanted to just focus on the sky more, I could get some of this darker color, some of this lighter color in here. 
and to some extent use a big brush with more loose, carefree brush strokes. It's kind of too much work for what I did, right? That's why selections are dumb. So I think I need to focus on this tower. A lot of this is just not up to snuff. And also there's lots of little details here that is good for the next detail pass. I'm going to switch my flow back to 100%. Just to demonstrate something I did in class. Uh, the reason that I like using hard brushes is because it's a lot easier to get multiple hard edges and slowly work your way into soft edges via painting. So if I color pick off of these, even with 100% flow, I can slowly work my way towards a transition of black to white. And additionally, if I really wanted to mess with these soft edges, I could do a lower flow at this point, and I could still technically grab this sky color and get a hard edge, right? And I could then further uh, blur this with either the smudge tool set to a uh, strength of 10, obviously and get a completely smooth transition if I really need it. Or the mixer brush. Now in comparison, Let's try doing that with a soft brush on soft opacity. If I have yield soft round, can I make a transition from black to white? Oh, wrong brush. As I was saying, soft round. So here's black, and I'm going to set this to 100% opacity, and here's white. So with a soft brush, you can lo logically get a transition that is soft. But in comparison, how difficult it is, is it to get a hard edge with this? Well, let's try and put like a hard edge box around this. So I can start there, and I lower my brush, I get closer and closer. And I get closer and closer. And I finally, at this point, uh, it's still got some pixels going on, but I guess that's a hard edge. But it took so much extra work and you lose the sense of the whole versus the sum of its parts. So, in conclusion, I like hard edge brushes. I'm going to see how much of this I can paint detail wise, just looking up here in the navigator.
And I think uh, I need to get like a really aggressive warm color into some of these. <coughs> so mud mixing is the idea that um, as you work, if you are mixing black with white, for instance, I'm going to put that orange there for later. So if I'm mixing black with white and green, let's say I want to transition from black to white to green, I can work a little bit at a time into here. But every time I mix this green with something, it's going to be slightly less green. So if I had to transition all that to this orange swatch over here, the more I do this, the more all these colors are mixing together. And therefore, the white is less white, the green is going to be less green, the orange is going to be less orange, the black is going to be less black. Which is fine, it's just that it's important to understand that uh, as you work, you're going to have these accidental areas that are suddenly less saturated than you wanted. And so a lot of times, what you can do to fix this is plan around that mud mixing and put something that's too vibrant. So this orange is technically far too aggressive to be here right now. but I can look at it instead as this problem of the lighter color over here that's going to mix with it and the darker shadow color. And by putting that in there to start with as a hue sort of statement, I can then start blending my way down from there. Set my strength to It's like a moon on top. So my opacity to 100%. I'm going to make my brush really tiny. It's like this dark black color. And I'm going to switch to my mouse. so that I can shift click some of this stuff in. And then I'll add in that highlight color.
So again, master copies are not a new idea. They are very handy to learn from. I like how, uh, you know, <clears throat> I'm probably being a little too hyperbolic about my Photoshop opinions. So I encourage you to go out and look up other artists who probably say the opposite of what I'm saying. Maybe they said that you should use layer mode transfers or you should use lots and lots of layers with lots and lots of masks. That's sort of the fun of this stuff. Is there's plenty of deep hyperbolic arguments to be had about the realist tradition. Switch to the mouse. There's this transition of the shadow into the light, <coughs> but this tower is up high, and the majority of the reflected light that it's getting is not the warm c tones that are coming off the ground that are reflecting up. It's too far away from that, but it is getting some of the skylight in there. And so it's kind of subtle, but it's just a little hint of blue there. All right, I'm going to create a new layer. It's one of those times where it's sensible. And I'm going to see if I can get some of these details in. Just painting a tiny little strip there. And 
and just transforming it a little bit. And then with my brush tool selected, I'm going to use the forbidden eraser at a very low flow. Just erase some of that until it looks like nice detail. Cool. Merge it down. Don't protect it. Chances are I'm going to find out I placed it wrong. I'll have to do it all over again anyways, right? There's this idea of lines that are interesting and I think if you have something that's like a shape that goes in and then out and then in and then out, uh, a lot of times what students want to do is sort of draw each individual chunk of that or have it as one line. And a lot of times it really is easier to just do it as one stroke and then grab the preceding color or the adjacent color and just make that texture through a more subtractive method. I'm going to get rid of all this crap that I've been using in the sky. Goodbye sky colors. I hope that earlier I made that fancy selection just to paint all over the sky and now I don't even care. There's something uh, really humbling about doing master copies because the more you do them, the better you'll get at everything at art, but particularly your master copies will get better, obviously. And as you get better and better at them, you'll notice more and more thoughts about these artists and you'll feel better and better at you, about yourself, but it sort of places you in the context of the rest of the world and, you know, is a master copy of a John Leon Jerome painting good? Is it possible for it to be good? Or is it just always going to be derivative of John Leon Jerome? So how did he paint this without some other artist beforehand giving him all these good ideas about how he should compose this painting?
Let's look at all these fine details, all these like ridges going along here. I create a new layer. Do some of these. Maybe around the top too. Let's do a lazy bevel. I'm holding Alt. And by the way, when you hold Alt and use arrow keys, you can clone out layers. Don't do it a million times, just do it once. So Alt, down arrow, clones that down. Lock the pixels, select a nice highlight color based on its neighbors. Fill that. And unlock the pixels, switch back to the move tool. You can move it up or down. I'm going to set that opacity to 70%, 60% over here on the layer palette. By the way, in the same way that if you have the brush selected, number pad changes your opacity over here. If you have the move tool selected with V, 1 through 10 sets your layer opacity. So having done that, I'm going to merge those two. And then switch back to the eraser tool and just gently erase it with the disgusting soft round brush. Down. Yeah. How do I still keep having dissolve stuff around here? This beautiful cast shadow. Gorgeous.
throw it through that on top. Over it. That's better. <coughs> Mine looks totally wrong. Okay, let's actually use some layer mode trickery. I'm going to try and change all this red paint stuff all at once. Got the lasso tool. And I'm deselecting stuff. I'm trying to do one row at a time so that I don't get as much perspective distortion doing this. I'm going to start up. There's an easier way to do this. Let's create a box that represents one stripe on a new layer. I'll just do that. Do Right around there. I'm assuming that these are painted somewhat equal distances.
So I could set it to multiply, but look, you're never going to find the truth of this color by trying to layer mode transfer math it in. So, I'm going to set this back to normal mode. Set its opacity to 100%. And click on it to select it. And now I'll just use that selection to actually paint this in kind of organically. By the way, if you control click on a picture or on the little icon for a layer, you'll select what it has. <coughs> Now I can also select a darker color. What things like here in the shadows. If I invert that selection, and hide it again, control H, I can go in in some lighter color. Close enough. <coughs> I am going to create a new layer and do the birds on it separate. Just because it's so obviously on the foreground as a final step. But it's kind of annoying to do that. Use this foliage brush. Sure, why not? And I don't really care about the correct color right now. I care about an accurate mask for this. I'm gonna control click on or control click on the icon 
and set that as its layer mask. And now, when I want to paint with some of this in here, go back to our trusty dusty oil pastel. Select a lighter color. And now I'm just trying to lessen their effect with the eraser tool. Just a touch. Sometimes something like this. It's too high up. So I'll hold up. Let's merge the birds down. No, let's keep the birds separate. So if I hold shift and or alt and move this down until it's the right size. It's pretty indistinguishable where it got moved. This sort of square section seems to have had the most wear and tear on it. So I'm going to lasso select that and work on it by itself. But I always hit Control H to hide it, so I have a selection here. I just don't want those dancing ants messing my eye up while I paint. That's all for now.